Society for the Promotion of Hellenic Studies. And I'm going to talk to you about the Battle of Plataea. What if the Greeks, and by that I mean some Greeks, had lost? And I'm going to be offering you a military hyphen cultural approach. Today is June the 11th. It's a very special day in my personal calendar. My father would have been 113 today if he'd only made it beyond where he actually did get, which was 81. It's special in another way. This is again personal. It is, in fact, the 90th birthday of Sir Timothy Sainsbury. And that may or may not mean anything to many of you, but he is a client of my wife, has been for many, many years. He's a major, major philanthropist. And to me, and to my wife, and to many, many others, he's been a very great mentor. So today is his 90th birthday. So why did I choose this particular topic to talk to you about on this particular day? Elizabeth, are we all right for the recording? Yeah, just to say that this is being recorded. It's not being live streamed. Hybrid lectures are in principle wonderful, so you could have 50 here. 150 or 650 uh, around the world. On the other hand, the quality of the picture for the people on Zoom or other platforms is very often less than 100%. And there is absolutely nothing like uh, an audience that you can actually see and in a way feel in 3D. This is the second such lecture I have given in the last three years. The previous one was at a certain school, now I'm going to name it, uh, Winchester College, where our Chancellor of the Exchequer was, well, what he considers to be educated. <laughs> anyway, I pitched up, I thought it would be just like you, a relatively moderate-sized gathering. It turned out it was about 150 people, very, very interesting, and I talked about Sparta. Well, of course, I'm also going to be talking about Sparta today. Sparta is... Uh, inevitable, unavoidable. So I have two main reasons for choosing this particular subject, this particular year. First is 2022 AD, or CE, is the 2500th anniversary of the battle. Now, you have to remember, there is no BC or BCE naught no AD or CE naught. So you add together 2022 and 479 and you get 2501, but you must take away one. <laughs> so this really, is, this really is the 2500th anniversary of the battle. But then you might say, okay, so what? Why this battle in particular? It was fundamentally important. It was historically decisive, both militarily and culturally, which is why I've put hyphenatedly military cultural. And yet, it has been neglected, sometimes even forgotten. Now, I wrote a book fairly recently about Thebes, ancient Greek Thebes. I'm still waiting for my honorary citizenship of Thebes. <laughs> <laughs> it's obviously in the post. At <laughs> any rate, you know the point there. Athens, <coughs> Sparta, Macedon, poor old Thebes. Well, I was able to point out, not only was it at moments incredibly interesting and exciting and important, but on the other hand, for 20 years it ceased to exist in antiquity because it was wiped out on the orders of Alexander the Great in 335 BC. So it was not just then forgotten, but um, non-existent, inexistent. Now the neglect uh, of the Battle of Petir is being remedied. I took part in a three-day webinar, that's the web seminar, organized from Washington DC. And it encompassed people from as far away as New Zealand, poor fellow, had to stay up till about 4 a.m. his time in order to give his talk at 6 p.m. the previous day, or whatever it was. So that's a start. I wrote a book myself in 2013, published it in 2013, in the Emblems series of the OUP New York, uh, 
And I chose as my emblem one object which I will be showing you a slide of later. It's a stele from Menevi in Attiki, which is ancient Achanai, or Kanez, and it contains two very, very significant texts, one of which relates specifically to this battle. And I called my book After Thermopylae, which was uh, a bit wicked, because many more people have heard of, apart from the makers of 300, of course, who, who didn't include the word Thermopylae in the movie, but people have heard of Thermopylae, and I'll be coming back to it later on. There is still, though, I believe, tons of space uh, for a little more consideration of this particular battle. But before I get to the actual talk, thank you. First to the Society for electing me its president. I'm in the end of my second year, coming to the end of it. I've got one more year to go. Secondly, but much, much more uh, importantly, to Fiona Hara at the back here, who is the Executive Secretary of the Society, but for her, nothing. But for her, absolutely nothing. SPHS uh, would function, let alone function as it normally does. Brilliant. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. And then, uh, thirdly, thanks to a dear friend and colleague who can't be here today, a Greek friend and colleague, Anastasia Christophilopoulou. I'm always very pleased when I manage to get out that <laughs> nine <laughs> syllables, I think it is. Um, she is a curator at the Fitzwilliam Museum. I am technically pretty much non-competent, very incompetent, techno-compromised. Um, and so she did this uh, slideshow. There are a couple of slips on a postcard to me afterwards, please, but um, I'll point them out there ones that I've spotted anyway. I mean, just in the words, the, the spelling, yeah, in the typography, not in the content or the meaning. <laughs> and then, of course, um, as well as the audience that may or may not choose to watch this as a uh, recording, thank you in particular for giving up your uh, Saturday afternoon. I really am most touched that you've come along to be here present. Thank you. Well, we live in 2022, so I can't uh, end my beginning without a trigger warning. What do you think that might be, Katrina? It's about the gore, the blood, the extreme nastiness of this particular battle. Don't worry, I'm not going to show you any of it, but I'm going to give you a quotation from, of course, a Greek tragedy, which indicates how perceived it was then. The tragedy dates to fall. 472, so it's seven years or so later. But looking back, this was a particularly unpleasant <laughs> battle. Therefore, um, not only was the outcome terribly important, but the process of getting to the outcome was uh, particularly uh, significant in, in that gory sense. Right. So we begin, uh, in a way, at the end, because this is a Greek, in a very special sense of Greek, uh, the people who swore an oath to resist the Persians. And there are only about 32, 33 separate communities out of maybe 700 in the Aegean Basin alone, out of about 1,000 in the Greek world as a whole, who were bold enough, um, courageous enough, to sign up, i.e. to swear in the name of, in particular, Poseidon and Zeus, that they would resist the Persian invasion that was going to come in 480, 479. And so this is the victory monument, which I'll explain why and how. It was originally in Delphi. It's now what's left of it in Istanbul, which was, of course, formerly Constantinople bit of a clue as to why it's where it is now. And apart from this, as a living uh, mem memorial of the battle, as we'll see soon, there's nothing much left of the battlefield uh, in terms of monuments or um, diagnostic traces of, you know, this is where that bit of 
The only other substantial extant, contemporary extant uh, residue of this battle is a fairly recently um, published in the sense that it had been found a hundred plus years ago in Oxyrhynchus, which is in the Nile Valley of Egypt. But it wasn't actually published. It's an elegy, and it was composed by the most famous praise poet of 479 BC, Simonides, or Simonides, who came from the island of Chaos, or Chaosia, as it's sometimes called. And it makes absolutely clear that the key roles played in the battle were those played by the Spartans and by the overall commanding officer of the entire Hellenic army, who was a Spartan. He wasn't a king uh, because he was a regent for the king, and his name was Pausanias, or Pausanias, and important not to confuse him with the much, much later Pausanias, Baedeker Pausanias, who's a very interesting geographical religious pilgrim of the second century AD, who gives us a continuous narrative of ancient um, Messenian and Laconian, i.e. Spartan history, but he's writing hundreds of years later, dependent, therefore, on much earlier sources. Now, I say that this um, <coughs> column is uh, predominantly Spartan. It's Greek, all Greek, in the sense that it's in the name of the Hellenes, but it's predominantly Spartan because Plataea was, as uh, our main source, who is Herodotus, I'll be coming to him shortly, very snappily described the battle. He called it the Calist A, that is, the either fairest, finest, or most beautiful victory of those we know. And so the Spartans deserve to have, as I'll show you later, the place associated with this particular monument. So, very quick recap of um, what we're talking about in geographical terms. And, uh, the key uh, region of Greece that is uh, at issue is, of course, the Otea, Boeotia, probably something to do with boos, uh, something to do with oxen, and um, quite unusually favorable to certain kinds of pasturage as well as cereal growing. In antiquity, its most distinctive feature was a lake, Lake Kopais, but this was drained in fairly modern times. So if you go there today, you have no real sense of the ancient geography, which the lake divided the ocean into a northern section, where the most important city was Orkhonos, and a southern section, where the most important city was Thebes. And by and large, over time, Thebes won out over Orkhonos. Unlike if you go all the way back to Homer, you'll find Orkhonos is in a superior position to Thebes in the catalogue of ships in Book Two of the Iliad. So that's where we have to focus our attention on. Plataea, I'll show you a map of that right now. Now, my uh, lovely Anastasia dug this out, I think online. You have to be terribly careful not to infringe copyright. So this comes from an atlas of 1825. And I don't have a pointer, but um, the Plataeans are down the very bottom, uh, if you can see that. And there is Lake Copais, quite clearly signaled there. And uh, Attiki is on the border. There's Attica written in its Latin form. And the distance from Thebes to Athens as the crow flies is something like 90 kilometers or 55 or so miles. So actually horribly close. And why am I banging on about that? Because in 479, Thebes and all the rest of the ocean were on the Persian side. Athens, Sparta, the principal leaders of the mainland resistance, with one or two island helpers. So Imagine the Persians have come all the way down. In 480 BC, they've, well, I'll come on to, maybe come on right away, and I'll come on shortly. Um, they march their way through Thermopylae, uh, they destroy 
existing thespiae, platea, destroyed. And then they, of course, destroy the Acropolis and the surrounding area, the Agora area, and other uh, places too. But how do we know there was a battle of platea? I sometimes ask myself in dark moments, <laughs> you know, did any of this ever actually really happen? How could I prove? That it really, well, there are occasional proofs. You find a battlefield, you find a corpse with a diagnostic bit of pottery dated to just the right uh, date, or with a particular type of helmet or a particular type of arrow, which fix the date. Um, you have other uh, indications. But um, we are almost entirely reliant on the accident of survival of one historian sometimes called the father of history, that's what um, Cicero called him, and but for him we would have no account of the entirety of Middle Eastern history, going back as far as the middle of the 6th century BC, let alone the specifics of the four major battles of 480 and 479, that is Thermopylae, uh, and that's Vizy, and Samus, and Plataea, and then there's a coda, just a sort of mopping up Mikai. So there are five principal battles, four uh, very important, one slightly less uh, so. Herodotus is on the left, and Thucydides is on the right. They're joined at the head, and they look fixedly forever in diametrically opposite directions. And I think that absolutely captures Thucydides. But for Herodotus, no Thucydides. But, but for Thucydides, no Thucydides. His historiography was very, very different in kind, in content, uh, from that of uh, Herodotus. Herodotus is what we call a total historian. We call him a cultural historian, an ethnographic historian. Thucydides has a little bit of geography, a little bit of ethnography, but he is fixed. And not just any old power, political power. And for him, that's a thing, an affair of men. There are, I think, 50 references to members of the female sex in all of extant Thucydides. There are many hundreds of references to women collectively and individually in Herodotus. Herodotus is interested in everything in principle, uh, and Thucydides in one big thing. So it's like the uh, old uh, Archilochus. And Herodotus's work is the longest extant work of prose, Greek prose from antiquity. And one wonders, yes, he might have delivered it in portions. Right, I'm going to give you today the Battle of Plataea, ladies and gentlemen, or probably gentlemen. And on the other hand, he might even extend it to a whole book if someone was prepared to sit around for quite a long time. But the entirety of it, which has an architecture, somebody called Myers, John Myers, once analyzed in ring composition the entirety. So A right at the beginning corresponds to A1 right at the end. And then in between, you get all the corresponding layers in what the Hellenistic scholars divided up into nine books, first of which being Cleo, the muse of uh, history. And Herodotus was, of course, called most Homeric. And so that's the wonder, the gigantic dimension. What he's interested in is preserving from loss of memory, whether total or partial, of great and wondrous deeds done not just by Greeks, but by Greeks and non-Greeks alike. And then he adds, this is from his preface, especially the reason or the explanation or the justification, ITA, why they fought each other. And of course, they fought each other on and off over a very long time, especially in the first two decades of the fifth century BC. He personally is one of the ornaments of the fifth century enlightenment, as it's sometimes called, a genius in his own literary terms. So I might cite him as my first, as it were, exhibit A. What if 
the Persians have won? Would Herodotus have had the life, the freedom, the audience with which to create what is very balanced? Don't go away with the idea that it is just like a Simonides poem for somebody who's paid him to sing his praises. No, it's balanced. The Persians aren't all bad, unlike the movie 300, where they are all bad. So we do sometimes progress, uh, but sometimes we go backwards. Perseans, I've showed you roughly where they're southern Boeotia, and therefore very close to the border with Attiki, with Athens. And so close were they that in the late 6th century, there was a contest between Thebes and Athens as to whether the Pateans would join the Boeotian state, which called itself the Boeotians. Some of us believe it was federal, a very, very early example of a proto-federal state. Well, the Pateans decided they wanted to have nothing to do with it. So if you like, they became traitors to the Boeotian name and cause, as Thebes saw it, die-hard enemies thereafter. Well, where do you turn if you've got the biggest power in your region as your main enemy? Well, you turn to the nearest big power that's going to be able to counteract Thebes, Athens. So, 490 BC, complicated reasons. Emperor Darius I, the Cuman ruler of the Persian Empire, which extended as far east as Afghanistan, Pakistan, into Africa, as well as Europe, because he already had what's today Thrace and Bulgaria, northern Greece, in other words, as part of his empire, decided he was very, very angry with the Athenians, because they had sent ships and men to attack one of his uh, vice-regal capitals, Sardis, in Lydia. So we're in 499-498 BC. Eight years later, Darius sends an expedition under a Mede, that is a northern Iranian. The Greeks were very ethnocentric. They called all Persians Medes, which is sort of like calling all Scots Welsh, or something like that, because they were related, but, but they were very distinct in all sorts of ways. That is, and then actually a brother, of his own, called Artaphernes or Artaphernes. Now, that is the Greek transcription of his Persian name. Herodotus's Persian was, shall we say, shaky. He thought all Persian names ended in sigma, so Artaphernes. No, they typically didn't. Um, Xerxes' name, probably something like Kshayatra, and Darius's name, something like Dariosh. And Greeks have, I think, never really found sh very easy to say. <laughs> and so the, that probably explains they prefer C. Why not? So that's enough, I think, about um, Yosha. Apart from moving on to the two Pateans. <coughs> now, why Pateans? When Datis and Artaphanes uh, landed, they landed famously, of course, they had marathon, they had uh, cavalry as well as infantry. Oddly enough, the cavalry played no role in the battle. But my point is not any of those. It is that the Athenians had one ally, somebody who came to help them when the Persians invaded, and that was Pratia. So very famously, in the plain of marathon is a huge mound. It's being played around with, excavated, probably bears very little relation to what it originally looked like in the 480s BC. And it's the uh, same name as the Hungarian financier Soros. Soros means a heap, and it's a massive great heap. Well, that is the tomb of, according to Herodotus, 192 Athenians. Not 193, not 191, but 192, as against well, he says there was something like 6,400 round figure on the Persian side who died at Marathon. There were 1,000 Pateans fighting. We think there were perhaps um, 9,000 Athenians. And of course, it was uh, an extraordinary, uh, unprecedented, and unpredictable. 
think if you want to say something like no one or very few people in mainland Greece had ever seen a Persian uh, enemy in a fighting before. So this is pretty terrifying in principle as well as the actuality. Two Boutians is what this much, much smaller lump is called. It has um, been found to contain some brains, but not enough, probably. Not diagnostic, not in other words, definitely 490 BC. But I put it there just to remind you that the Battle of Marathon, which often is thought to be just an Athenian victory, the Athenians themselves often portrayed it so, actually was a victory of the Athenians and the Plataeans. And so it was on the soil of these men's relatives and sons and so on, 10, 11 years <coughs> later, that the Battle of Plataea was going to be fought. And it was where the graves, of course, of all those who fell, according to what was very, very few, um, by comparison with the Persians at Marathon or with the Persian side at Plataea, but the Plataeans were very, very keen on their association, not surprisingly, with the Battle of Plataea. And some of you may have read in Thucydides, book three, there's a dialogue, rather unpleasant one, in front of Spartan judges, between Plataean speakers and Theban speakers. Theban <coughs> speakers are saying, these Plataeans, they're allies of our enemies, the Athenians, they're traitors, they should all be executed. And the Plataeans say, ah, but remember the Battle of Plataea. Look what we did. Now, this is calculated to apply and to appeal to the Spartans, because for the Spartans, the Plataea battle was their battle. However, um, it ended badly, and um, the Plataea was destroyed yet again. I've already mentioned <coughs> its destruction in 480. In 426, the Thebans destroyed it um, yet again. And then it was to be destroyed by the Thebans again in the fourth. You know, Plataea has a very checkered, uh, shall we say, history. Now, somehow or other, Ioannidas has got uh, cut off uh, at the knees almost. <laughs> but at any rate, many of you will probably have been to Thermopylae, Thermopylae, the hot gates, so called because the springs, the sulfur springs, which are still used as bathing um, waters, uh, are in the pass. Uh, you can feel them if you just stop off by the road and watch the water running down. And in the mid-50s, a bunch of uh, Greek Americans got together to pay for this memorial. Much later, 15 years later, a memorial was added for the people of Thespiae. Now, Thespiae, like Plataea, was destroyed by the Persians because it opposed the Persians. It fought on the side of the Greek resistors against the Persian invaders. So you have now two major monuments in this uh, valley. And the Spartans, of course, have made, and modern Spartans, I mean my fellow citizens, I'm an honorary citizen of modern Sparta, terrific thing of this uh, heroic resistance under one of the two Spartan kings. Actually, it was a defeat. I mean, a very serious defeat, the battle of the way it held the Persians up. It set an example of courage, and therefore, in a way, was absolutely crucial for cementing a very shaky alliance, which might otherwise have fallen apart. As the Persians pour through Thermopylae, their fleet pours down to the area of Athens port, and the next major confrontation is, of course, going to be the Battle of Salamis. But Thermopylae is the Spartan myth, and, and it's actually very often wrongly taken as a myth in the sense of false, even today. For example, I expect many people think all the 300 Spartans died at Thermopylae. Actually, they didn't. Leonidas died, 298 of the 300 died, but the other two, for different reasons, survived the Battle of Thermopylae. So that's a myth uh, to be uh, struck off. The other myth which actually came to bite the Spartans later was, you Spartans never surrender. 
Well, actually, in the next major confrontation, Greek Greek, the so called Peloponnesian War, 45, a bunch of Spartans and admittedly lesser Laconians uh, who weren't full Spartan citizens, they surrendered and they were taken uh, as hostages back to Athens. They were put in a pen in the open, and for four years they were there, somewhere near the Agora, where people could come up and look and jeer at them and make fun of them. And one, this is in Thucydides, uh, one ally of the uh, Athenians, so he says, came up and asked a Spartan, you know, what, what was wrong with you in 45? Why did you surrender? We were told you never surrender. Ah, well, the uh, guy gave a classically laconic, that is snappy and witty response. He said, we weren't actually fighting against real men then, you know, because what did for us, and he used a, a word which means spindles, uh, a woman's implement in weaving. So we were killed by <laughs> a feminine uh, implements in a most unmasculine way. So giving up was not a sign of our lack of masculinity. Uh, we weren't fighting really against men anyway. Yeah. So that's the sort of gender politics that you would get in, in ancient Greece in the fifth century, focusing on this constant to and fro of dialogue, dialectic, but typically hostile interchange between Athens and Sparta. Who is the best Greek? Which Greeks really saved Greece from the Persians? And that's a long-going, ongoing culture war, which I'll, I'll come back to shortly. So I just want to give you one little shot of the sort of things that um, were being produced in Sparta by craftsmen who probably weren't full Spartan citizens. They were very, very good uh, at, in particular, small bronze lost wax figurines. And this is really teeny tiny. It's now in a museum in uh, Hartford, Connecticut. And it's um, unusual because it has that transverse crest. There is no other example. The so-called Leonidas, which is, of course, in marble, he has a crest back to front, a mohawk, as it were. But this one is thought possibly, therefore, to represent not just any ordinary Spartan. He's wearing his typically Spartan cloak that would be dyed red from the juice of the Murex mollusk, which um, is fished in great quantities off the Laconian coast. And it's thought possibly, therefore, that this guy is not, as I say, just any old ordinary Spartan on, as it were, night duty, but maybe a commanding king. And from the late 6th century onwards, the Spartans um, had a bit of trouble with their two kings. Um, if they disagreed, that could be really very difficult to maintain an expedition. And it actually happened. And thereafter, the Spartans passed a law. Only one king could command any one Spartan-led force. So you might have two kings in the same battlefield or at war at the same time, but they're not commanding the one same army. So, and I can think it was an early version of Orsanias. And one distinctive feature, I don't know if it's coming across to you, but it's clear to me, is hair. Normal adult Greek males cut their hair and grew a beard. Alexander the Great was one of the first to abandon the beard. He was the first to shave. This was thought to be pretty shocking. It looks like a boy or a woman. Yes, but he was manly enough without this extra adult. Spartans were um, peculiar in their facial hair or head hair in two ways. One, when they became adolescent and older, so late teens, let's say, they stopped cutting their hair. And I always feel a bit sorry for the presumably were slap heads among the Spartans who desperately tried to maintain the national uh, garb, you know, of having long hair, or his are coming right down over his shoulder. And there are tons of examples of that. The other peculiarity was that Spartans shaved the moustache. They grew a beard, but they shaved a moustache. And this is a 
source much later, but it says when the chief officials of the state came into office every year, the EFORs, they issued two proclamations. One to the Spartans, shave your moustaches and obey the laws. And those of you who know the statue I'm referring to, the Leonidas, as it's called, he has no moustache, classically Spartan. Second injunction was to declare that all the helots, who are Greek, they're natives, they've been there forever, they worship the same gods as the Spartans, goddesses, heroes, heroines, they worship the same pantheon, and yet they're treated as if they are not unpersons because they were allowed families, but as unfree. And so whenever one reads, as one does in, uh, for example, Aeschylus's Persians, come on Greeks, fight for your freedom. And indeed, the Spartans were right up there fighting for the freedom of themselves from being taken captive, prisoner, or killed by a barbarian enemy. But back home, they kept in servitude thousands upon thousands, many more times bigger than themselves, uh, Greeks. And it's just one of those, well, puzzles is not quite the right word because I think they are actually the key to explaining a lot of peculiarities about Sparta. But it's something that one mustn't forget when you think of the Spartans going off to Thermopylae, going off to Plataea. Well, at Plataea, they took with them, allegedly, Herodotus, 35,000 of these uh, helots, as opposed to 5,000 of themselves. Seems almost unbelievable. And they were armed, uh, as light armed. Not heavy armed, not as heavy armed infantry and hoplites, but as uh, soldiers for Tenerife. So, moving on. View of the Petia Battlefield. <laughs> and uh, Germany, German has a wonderful word, Trummerfeld, a field of ruins. And that's what you're looking at there, of course. And it's a reminder that by 479, high summer, 479, August, September, the actual city of Plataea was in ruins. I mean, it didn't exist physically. If you don't have a city centre where you can meet, hold meetings, and uh, establish yourselves as a corporate body of Plataeans, then Plataea doesn't exist. So that's simply to remind you of how rough the situation was. The Athenians were cityless in a different way. They had decided to abandon their city before the Persians came. Persians had then destroyed the Acropolis and below, and they did it again in the summer of 479, not long before the Battle of Plataea. But the Athenians were, as it were, en masse as a polis, a, a citizen state, on the ships. So they retained a corporate entity. Sparta, a long way away, deep down in the Peloponnese, with an isthmus between them and central Greece. Herodotus goes on about how the Spartans kept worrying about whether or not the wall across the isthmus would be finished in time to stop the Persians coming down into the Peloponnese. I think this is all a bit of a Athenian propaganda, because actually that was never serious starter. If the Spartans were going to seriously take on the Persians, it would have to be beyond the Isthmus, not in the Peloponnese, and it would have to be en uh, masse by land, because Sparta was a, a, a land power. I've contributed a chapter to a forthcoming Cambridge companion. It's Cambridge World History of Genocide. And a friend of mine who's actually editing it, Ben Kiernan, he's written a book in which the word genocide and Spartans appear side by side. And he's referring to the helots. Well, I think it's a bit of a, a stretch. But for the helots, no Sparta. So it wasn't really in the Spartans' interest to wipe them out. And they never actually had that project. But my chapter is actually about a number of cities which either Greeks wiped out of other Greeks, or foreigners, as in the case of Persia, uh, or finally Alexander and Thebes. It's a, it's a recurring pattern. Greeks were not nice to each other when things 
got uh, hot. So, I've mentioned already how this is a, a, a really major battle. I'm not going to go through all the figures and all the troops on, on various sides. But one fairly reliable estimate would say there were as many as 180,000 combatants in the, it was over about a couple of weeks on and off. It was a sort of 11 day standoff and then finally the battle happened. And all rather messy. And as I've said before, there's a, I haven't actually come across it myself until fairly recently, a passage in the Persai of Aeschylus, who fought at Marathon. And this is lines 8, 16 and following. And they're spoken by the ghost of Darius, who's of course exceptionally disappointed that uh, Xerxes is doing so badly in the Persian Wars, because the Persia is set immediately after the Battle of Salamis, the Athenian Battle of Salamis. And Darius says, as, uh, among other things, so great will be the mass of courted gore spilled by the Dorian, that is Spartan, spear upon Plataean soil. And I say 180k roughly, that makes it a bigger battle than either Waterloo or Gettysburg just to give you two absolutely major, decisive battles of the 19th century. The Greeks, of course, were not very ancient Greeks uh, at numbers. They used the same letters, the same word, for 10,000 moriori as for countless. So in other words, beyond 10,000 just seemed absolutely enormous. So Herodotus tells us seriously that Xerxes brought 5,200,000. We modern historians think mm, 180, 200,000 possibly, of whom a good number fought at the Battle of Plataea. Right, so we come to, as it were, the turning point of the lecture. I've brought you to the battle which was a damn near more run thing, as Wellington said of uh, Waterloo. And if you believe Herodotus's account, it was pretty chaotic. If you read Ephorus's account, a later one, it all went according to plan. But according to Herodotus, um, the Spartan command, that is Porcenix, was not exactly brilliant. And even one Spartan commander, which is completely against type, refused orders at one point. Some of us just think that's probably made up as a slur on the spot. But anyway, the battle in Herodotus is a very, very uh, messy sort of thing. Its outcome, however, is uh, absolutely clear. There was never again to be a Persian invasion of Greece by land. They, they didn't contemplate the was some thought or some feeling in the Peloponnesian War that a, a fleet which was funded by the Persians conceivably might um, be Persian in some sense attacking mainland Greece, but actually never eventuated. And so in the sense that what we call Greek, Hellenic, culture, society, politics were free from the major threat and the instantiated threat of 499 to 479, after 479. Indeed, to such an extent that an alliance led by the Athenians took the struggle in the opposite direction and landed some really severely heavy blows on the mighty Persian Empire without ever seriously threatening the Persian Empire's future existence, as, of course, Alexander was to do 150 odd years later. Now I select the Parthenon, you might think, you know, how cliched. Well, that's precisely the point. Many people, not just us historians, speak of a golden age in the fifth century BC, centered on Athens, but not exclusive to Athens, or centered on Athens because that was century pedal. Athens was the capital of culture of all ancient the ancient Greek, if you like, Eastern ancient Greek world, not 
the West, not Sicily, South Italy, which had its own amazing uh, centers. Peter Green wrote a book called The Shadow of the Parthenon, his point being that it casts a shadow over all subsequent Hellenic and therefore Western European history. Now we today, heirs to Black Lives Matter, to Me Too, are very, very conscious of all the defects of that Hellenic high cultural civilization of the fifth century by our modern standards. That building, where do you think the marble came from? Well, the Pentelli. It's quite a long way away. How did it get there? Who actually physically hewed the stone, hacked into it, put it onto carts, and transported it? And if I went up the Acropolis, or near to it, only a couple of weeks ago, I wasn't crazy enough, it was 33 degrees. <coughs> it's extremely high. And so, um, just I'm making the point, slave did both the casual, heavy, unskilled labor. And if we were to extrapolate <coughs> from famously the Erechtheon later, they very likely some non-Greek, non-free citizen Greeks also carved some of the intricate uh, moldings and uh, uh, so on that adorn the exterior of the structure. So, um, as for the status of women, there is an irony the chief religious official of the Athenian democratic state was a woman, because she was the hereditary, aristocratic, by birth, priestess of Athena of the city. And this is not the temple of Athena of the city, that is the later Erechtheon, Erechtheon. This is the temple of one particular Athena, Athena Parthenos, and it's a very peculiar temple. It doesn't have its own <coughs> dedicated altar. And what makes a temple in ancient Greece religious is the altar on which you sacrifice the relevant animal or liquid to the relevant deity. So what is this? Well, you probably know this later on as the Athenian Empire developed and it shifted its money from the island of Delos, the treasury, to Athens. This was completed in 432. This becomes the Bank of England or Fort Knox. So it's a very, very peculiar, uh, special, uh, unique sort of building. And it's sometimes identified as a peculiarly democratic symbol. Now, I'm not against that, because all the procedures of voting on shall we build it? When shall we build it? Why wasn't it built until the 440s? Why did they wait? Well, some people think they didn't, but um, most of us think they did. Who was on the committee that decided to allocate how much <coughs> funds and who watched to see how the funds were spent? Well, well, they were all committees of the council and the assembly and therefore of the democracy. It's an entirely democratic. It's not, in other words, funded by Mellon or Getty, which is the standard mode of funding any major <laughs> construction, as you well know today, as it always has been. A naming opportunity. No, this is the Athena Parthenon. It's not um, the Pericles Parthenon. And uh, Pericles was intimately associated with the building. And that, of course, was very, very important. So, what goes with the Parthenon? This is but one symbol of what the Athenians collectively and all those that, whose labor, whose skill they could commandeer were capable of producing something absolutely extraordinary. But, just to add, what else was going on? Well, a great deal. Theatre, I've mentioned already a couple of times. The foundation of the idea, not just the practice, of our modern Western theatre rhetoric, and therefore high culture in a written literary form. The highest visual art sculpture, of course, mainly in bronze, which doesn't survive against by and large uh, melted down, but also, of course, in marble, uh, of course, painted, very unlike our contemporary aesthetic. Science, especially medicine, these are all flourishing, the Hippocratic corpus, 
develops from roughly the 460s, 450s BC, carries on through into the 4th century, of course. And, well, in a way, Sava um, but philosophy. This is the age of Socrates. Socrates was born in 470, uh, 469, so 20 years before the Parthenon was begun. And he died uh, by self-administered hemlock in 399, age 70, after the Peloponnesian War, partly in direct consequence of the Peloponnesian War, partly as revenge on people like him, who Democrats thought had taken the wrong side in the Peloponnesian War, or had supported the very vicious oligarchs we know as the 30 Tyrants. So for all those reasons, would any of those have happened but for Battle of Plataea being the finally decisive battle in the Greek and Persian Wars of 499, if you like, to 479. I think um, the answer to that must be no. But counterfactual history is uh, very popular in certain quarters. What if? Whole books are written about it. And of course, it's always possible to argue that some form of Hellenic culture would have been tolerated by the Persians as it was tolerated between 545 or so and when the Greeks of Asia Minor rebelled in 499. But for that half century, there was some sort of Hellenic culture going on on the uh, western seaboard of Asia. However, the big change, and that's where I think democracy is one thing that the Persians would not have tolerated was a flourishing, independent democracy. It would have meant nothing to them, totally alien as a mode of discourse and decision making. And it's an irony of historiography that if you read Herodotus Book 3, you will come to what's called the Persian debate, which is a thoroughly and entirely Greek debate, all the concepts exclusively, they couldn't be anything but Greek, with some exception for perhaps autocracy, tyranny, monarchy. But the other stuff, the sort of oligarchy the Greeks had, the sort of democracy. And yet, Herodotus, um, well, could he have written, could he have existed, could he have conceived what he did, but for the conditions within which he grew up and was able to flourish? He was born in about 484, just before the main conflict that he was to describe 25, 30 years later. He's said to have, we have very little biographical information, he's said to have um, been involved in a local rising against a pro-Persian tyrant and therefore been exiled, and he therefore found his way to Athens. And it was, of course, Athens that was the making of him, though he wrote, or spoke, in uh, a funny kind of hybrid dialect, which is not actually one that anybody really spoke. It's basically Homeric, and that's another reason he's called Homeric. It's Ionic rather than um, uh, his own Doric, which was his native uh, dialect. And it's not Attic, which is, of course, the Athenian's version of Ionic. So the Parthenon democracy, he wrote, if I was to be asked to say, what three things do I not think would have been possible had the Persians won in 479? Those would be them. But Greeks must be Greeks. And um, there was a, an ancient saying, you know, there's nothing as bad as an Attic neighbor, I mean, Athenian, on your borders. But actually, most neighbors um, are pretty hostile to each other. And even relatively distant neighbors like the Athenians and Sparta. So yes, for that brief moment, Athens and Sparta united against the Persian invader, 479. Within two years, already, they were at loggerheads with each other. How best should we liberate those Greeks who are still in the Persian Empire? Who is to lead that campaign of liberation. So the Athenians got fed up and founded their own quite separate alliance with new oaths uh, which were to be permanent. In other words, as long as the Persian Empire existed, 
this alliance should uh, persist. And it was that alliance, we call it first the Delian League and the Athenian Empire, that was what Pericles advised and led and in a way took into the next major confrontation, Greek-Greek, a kind of civil war, the so-called Athena-Peloponnesian War. And I have selected just to illustrate one freeze block from the temple of Athena Niki. Now what victory would Athena victory be referring to? You're right, over the Persians, way back when. In other words, a victory that the Spartans equally share. But this is a very peculiarly Athenian temple. Where is it located? You want to go up on the Acropolis? You want to go through the Acropolia to the Parthenon? You go by the temple of Athena Niki. It hits you in the face. Well, I asked Anastas here to have this particular image for that very huge, if you think of the dimensions, and he's a Persian lying on his side. Well, those of you who remember your Herodotus book 9, one of the very early episodes in the Battle of Plataea is where a huge Persian in glittering chain mail is felled. He's a sort of Goliath, and his name is Mazistios. Well, that, I think, is what the sculptor, the designer, and then the viewers imagined to be Mazistios. But he wasn't killed by an Athenian. And the battle of Plataea was a Spartan victory. Yes, there were lots of Athenians there, but the actual decisive fighting was done in the decisive battle by the Spartans. And so this is part of an ongoing culture war which really hadn't ceased. I mean, it started pretty much in the 470s, and it goes way on through. And my next slide is of a particularly um, momentous moment in this culture war. In the 30s, a farmer at Menevi, his plow struck a very big stone. <laughs> he thought it was a rock, but actually it was a finished steely. And uh, it's in two parts. There's the relief, a hoplite shield with hoplite equipment, a breastplate, and some helmet on either side. So this is something to do with being a hoplite, a heavy armed infantry fighter. Well, you learn more about it when you look at the very beautifully laid out stoichedon. Each row of letters is directly uh, straight, you know, crisscross, grid pattern. <coughs> Two texts. One which is uh, of its time. So it explains why it was set up this, when it was set up. In the three colonies, <coughs> the Athenians had suffered a terrible defeat together with the Thebans against Philip of Macedon and his son Alexander. Battle of Chironia Paranea in Boeotia. Boeotia, uh, as Epaminondas called it, the orchestra, the dancing floor of Ares, the god of war. Lots of battles fought in Boeotia. So this first is dedication by the priest of Ares and the temple of Ares. There's only one. There are very, very few temples in Greece to the god of war. The god of war was rather feared and despised and hated. He wasn't loved uh, at Akarnai. And some of you may have seen a performance of uh, Aristophanes' Akarnians. You'll remember. Why did he choose the Akarnians as the name of his chorus? Because they're the most bellicose. They're the most ones wanting to get their hands on the Spartans. They have a temple of Ares, unlike every other dean. There were 139 villages or deans in, in Attica. And so it's an oath of the Epi boy, people who are on the threshold, Epi, Hebe, which means full adult age. So they're 18 to 20. And they sign up for two years military service and they swear that they will be loyal and that they list a whole load of gods, goddesses, of course, Ares, Athena, and so on that they will honor, and they will patrol the boundaries, they'll do, they'll be one. So they're on the cusp of becoming full Athenian citizen hoplite warriors. Hence the imagery at the top. Second text, Oath of Gosh, and we normally refer to as the Oath of Plataea. It purports to be, well, not just Athenians, 
but also as fathers, swore, well, when exactly? It is possible to find a moment. Spartans are coming up from Sparta. Athenians are moving northwest from Athens. They've got to meet somewhere before they move on to the battlefield of Plataea. And one very symbolic place to meet, and it's very relevant to Plataea as well, is Eleusis, the sanctuary of Demeter. There's a lot of Demeter stuff in Herodotus in the Plataea battle. And so it is not impossible that when the 8,000 Athenian hoplites met the 10,000 Lacedaemonian hoplites, 5,000 Spartans, 5,000 Perioikoi, they swore another oath, in other words, on top of the oath that they'd all already sworn right before the Persians invaded. We swear to resist you, however, wherever. It's possible, but is it necessary? And then you look at all the details, and this was the point of my book, After Thermopylae. And on balance, my view is that it's probably a fake. And it's part of the culture war. And, and what it's saying is, we Athenians sacrificed as much as you Spartans at Plataea. We contributed just as much at Plataea as you Spartans. And why in 335? Well, I've mentioned Chironia. That applies particularly to the uh, Athenians, because they just, Spartans didn't resist Macedon. So they didn't get defeated by Macedon. They didn't get invaded by Macedon. So they weren't really of any significance whatsoever in the 330s. Why, therefore, would you want to put this in a stele, which Probably the original will be circulated more widely. Certainly the oath is generic. It's not just a Carnian. It's not local. But the other one, what's the point of it? Well, the leading Athenian politician of the second half of the 330s was a man called Lycurgus. Really? Same name as the most famous Spartan. Probably a myth. Lycurgus of Sparta, but anyway, um, the same name. And he knew a lot about Sparta, and he actually quotes a Spartan poet, though he rather wickedly says, no, he wasn't really Spartan, he was actually an Athenian lame whom the Spartans hired. Again, culture wars. But Lycurgus would be a major figure behind what's been looked at as a kind of internal reform. If you've suffered a major defeat, imagine Germany in 1945, You've got to do something really to reconfigure yourself, to pull yourself together, to give yourself ideals. And that, I think, is the context in which the oath of Plataea uh, should be slotted. And I would end with by taking you right back to where I started with the serpent column, the commemorative bronze, three coils, three heads at the top, one of which has survived rather good. It's dug up in the earth below. It fell off. I mean, the thing was complete, um, what, two or three hundred years ago? As recently as that, you know, it's not been destroyed hundreds of years ago. But why is it in Constantinople? Because Constantine, he's going to found a new Rome. <coughs> he takes Byzantium as his new capital. He renames it immodestly after himself. Well, Alexander had had lots of cities named after him. So just one has really been very modest. And Constantinople is its home. It's actually in the Hippodrome uh, area of the uh, Constantinople, Istanbul. Originally Delphi, and so I've got two questions which I'll try to answer briefly. Why did the Spartans set up their victory monument? For, in particular, it's after Plataea, but it's, um, the heading says, these fought the war, and the war must mean all the battles. Why in Delphi and not elsewhere? Were there alternatives possible? And then secondly, why snakes? And in a way, the answers go, go together. Delphi was one of the four major panhellenic <coughs> shrines of ancient Greece, where games took place on a regular circuit. It was number two in priority to Olympia. So the question really is not so much why Delphi, 
But why not Olympia? Zeus, after all, was the principal god of all the Greeks. Because the Olympic site and festival was managed by the city of Elis. Elis was an ally of Sparta within its own organization. But, Herodotus says, very suspiciously, they turned up late for the Battle of Plataea. <laughs> now, there's no excuse for that, because you know the army would muster in the Peloponnese, in the Nemea region. So Olympia, you come over from the far west, Elis, you come. No excuse for them to be late. But that's because we know in the next decade, Sparta's fighting against Elis, Mantinea, other allies who were not happy with the way the Spartans were conducting themselves. We are told by Herodotus that there was a commemorative statue of very large bronze at another of the Panhellenic sites, and that is Isthmia, which is in honor of um, Poseidon near Corinth. And that was where the oaths originally were sworn. All those very few Greeks who were going to fight the Persians resist. They swore the oaths in the sanctuary of Apollo at um, the Isthmus. So that explains, I think, why Delphi in a geopolitical sense. Secondly, Sparta and Delphi, the Delphic Oracle, had a, if you like, special relationship. Two officials by each of the kings, so four altogether, were permanent ambassadors, sacred ambassadors, to the shrine of Delphi and the Apollo Delphi uh, Oracle. So if Sparta had a major problem, internal and external, and they wanted sanction from above, they would send to Delphi. Nothing unusual, I mean, Sparta's not unique, but it was very particularly the way Spartans did things. How had Apollo come to be in control of Delphi? By slaying an enormous snake, Python. And so another name for Delphi was Putho. That's the name of the site. So there's a very snaky feel to Delphi and Apollo, and that would be suitable. But finally, I think the clincher is this. Snake sheds its skin. It was therefore seen as a symbol of rebirth. Entirely appropriate, therefore, when you're celebrating dead heroes who you hope will have a happy afterlife, obviously down below in ancient Greek thoughts, not up above. You therefore want to do all you can in your funeral ritual to ease their passage from above to below. If you go to the Sparta Museum, as uh, Lynette uh, recently did, you'll see lots and lots of stelae, that is slabs with uh, figured decoration of a hero, often with his hand like this under his chin, sitting on a stool or something like that. He's the dead man. And behind him rears up a snake above his head, very friendly, you know, looking after him. Uh, one uh, in cooperation with Zeus Milichius was to, you know, depicted the gentle, the calming Zeus was depicted as a snake. So snakes are very positive. And um, that is where, if you've had the patience to bear with me and been listening, thank you very much for listening.